Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. It's weird, like, who do you love? Ow, ow, no, no, sit, sit. Hello, and welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're taking a look at 16 Candles, the 1984 coming-of-age comedy about a girl's sweet 16th birthday that becomes anything but sweet as she suffers from every embarrassment possible. They fucking forgot my birthday. Following the success of Mr. Mom, which we covered in our last video, Hughes made the leap from writing to directing, with 16 Candles being his directorial debut and the first in his series of iconic teen movies, a subgenre that he essentially invented. This film really kicked the door wide open for Hughes' directing career, giving us some memorable teen characters along with some major 80s slang. Geek. Way to go, dickface. She had a hissy. Real smooth. Boom. Uh, don't spaz out. Mike thinks I'm a dork. Don't have a cow. I've never bagged a babe. Hughes was known for chain smoking and blaring music while writing and wrote the entire 16 Candle screenplay over a single 4th of July weekend. Now, before we continue further, we'd like to thank you for watching John Hughes Revisited. If you enjoy our shows, like this video, please subscribe to our channel right now, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes live. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. After seeing her headshot, Hughes cast then-unknown Molly Ringwald in the lead role. Reportedly, Hughes was so inspired by Ringwald's appearance, he put the headshot up over his desk and wrote the film with her specifically in mind for Samantha. Before Ringwald was cast, she almost lost the part of Samantha Baker to Ali Sheedy, her future co-star in The Breakfast Club. Laura Dern and Robin Wright also auditioned for the role of Sam. Anthony Michael Hall plays Ted Farmer, or Farmer Ted. I'm not really a farmer or simply the geek. Hughes wrote the role of Ted Farmer specifically for Hall as well, after having been impressed by his work on National Lampoon's Vacation. Jim Carrey and Keith Coogan also auditioned for the role. Hughes claimed every single kid who came in to read for the part did the whole stereotyped high school nerd thing. You know, thick glasses, ballpoint pens in the pocket, white socks. But when Michael came in, he played it straight, like a real human being. I knew right at that moment that I'd found my geek. Initially, Ringwald and Hall disliked each other, so Hughes took them to a record store and they bonded after they found out that they liked the same music. One of the groups they both liked was the Rave Ups, which Ringwald scribbled onto Samantha's notebook. Even though Sam ends up with Jake at the end, Ringwald and Anthony Michael Hall actually dated briefly in real life, between this film and The Breakfast Club. The role of Jake Ryan came down to Michael Schofling and Viggo Mortensen. Mortensen really caught Ringwald's attention. She told Axis Hollywood that she really wanted him. He made her weak in the knees. Oh my. In the end, the filmmakers went with Michael Schofling. Apparently, Schofling was so shy during his audition, it almost cost him the job. What? Producer Michelle Manning said he was so stunning and dreamy that we cast him. Carlin Glenn, who plays Samantha's mom Brenda, confronted Hughes about the fact that the script didn't call for her to apologize for forgetting her daughter's birthday, despite the fact that her character was described as a good and attentive mother. Hughes agreed, and added the scene where Brenda tearfully apologizes to Sam. Paul Dooley plays Samantha's dad. Initially, he turned it down since he felt it was a stock dad character without much development. Hughes called Dooley personally and told him that he wrote a scene with his and Ringwald's characters, which became an iconic moment in the film. Later on, Dooley said he'd have viewers tell him that they wished that he were their father based on that scene alone. Good. Get my money for it. Also, in that very same scene, the original script ended with the heart-to-heart -heart by having the dad ask his daughter what exactly happened to her underwear, which she gave to Ted Farmer. <sighs> Molly Ringwald's mother rightfully pointed out that it was weird for a girl's father to ask that. Hughes agreed that yes, it was creepy, and changed the line. Thank you, Mama Ringwald. Haveline Morris plays Caroline, the rowdy drunk party girl who also vies for Jake's affections. In real life, Morris is actually a natural redhead, but Hughes only wanted one redhead in the film, so she had to wear a wig for the duration of shooting. Getty Watanabe plays Long Duck Dong, an Asian foreign exchange student whose character has been the subject of much scrutiny. His accent isn't real. I love a visiting with a grandma and a grandpa. As Watanabe imitated the accent of his South Korean friend, 
The actor eventually admitted to Hughes that the accent wasn't real, as he was actually from Utah. While he was worried about being fired over this, Hughes simply laughed at the realization. I've never been so happy in my whole life. <laughs> Watanabe would go on to play Ling in the animated Mulan movie. He also starred in Ron Howard's Gung Ho with Michael Keaton, Mr. Mom himself. Brian Doyle Murray, a frequent Hughes collaborator, plays the Reverend. Brother and sister John and Joan Cusack appear briefly. John plays Bryce, one of Ted's geeky friends, and Joan is the geeky girl yeah. who has trouble drinking water from the fountain. Out of the main cast, the only two actors who were actually teens were Ringwald and Hall, while everyone else was well into their 20s. As is tradition with most of Hughes' films, 16 Candles was filmed primarily in and around the Chicago North Shore communities during the summer of 1983. Molly Ringwald was allowed to decorate Sam's bedroom with items from her own to make it feel as authentic as possible. The costume designer, Mark Peterson, begged Ringwall not to wear the hat she wore in the first act. Ringwall insisted, and after the movie was released, teen girls started wearing their hats tilted back like that. Sam's room was a set built inside the high school gym, which is where they filmed the dance sequence too. The dress that Sam wears to the dance was supposed to be worn by Leanne Curtis, who plays Randy, but when Molly Ringwald saw it, she asked to wear it instead. They didn't have enough money to air condition the gym, so it was over 100 degrees during filming. It was so hot that Havely Morris changed dresses between takes due to all the sweat. Morris also didn't want to film the shower scene because the point was that she had bigger breasts than Sam and Randy, which she didn't in real life. So they had a more well-endowed body double for her playing a high schooler in the shower. According to the book, You Couldn't Ignore Me If You Tried by Susanna Gora, Ringwald stated that because she and Anthony Michael Hall were too young to entertain themselves at bars or nightclubs, they often spent their weekends off from filming, crashing the bar and bat mitzvah receptions that were held at the hotel in Illinois where the cast was staying for the shoot. During the scene at the dinner table, many of the younger cast members can be seen trying to hold back laughter or smiles. This was because, while filming, Watanabe was doing things off camera while reading his lines. According to Ringwald, one of the things he would do was stick grapes up his nostrils. Apparently, there's also a deleted scene where Long Duck Dong sings at the dance. Samantha's dad's car has the license plate V58, which stands for Vacation 58, a story written by John Hughes. Jake Ryan's Porsche also had the plate number 21850 for Hughes' birthday of February 18th, 1950. Oddly enough, Ringwald's birthday is also February 18th. The Rolls Royce that Jake lends to Ted to take Caroline home was owned by a friend of Hughes' father. Just goes to show you're never too old to ask to borrow your parents' friend's car. The cafeteria scene is only included in the televised broadcast and was never in the theatrical version, nor on the VHS or DVD versions. There's another cut scene with Long Duck Dong and his girlfriend going to a drive-in restaurant and causing a bit of trouble. These scenes were later cut, but it explains why there's a tray on the side of Grandpa's car. While Rudy's father explains his business activities to the bakers, the song playing in the background is the love theme from The Godfather. I dabble a little bit in personal loans and politics. When Sam sees her grandparents for the first time, the theme from The Twilight Zone plays. Where are my blue socks, Father? You mean to tell me you didn't pack them? Oh, not again, Howard. And when Ted is walking up the bus aisle to sit next to Sam, the theme from Dragnet plays. The film was released on May 4th, 1984, and in its opening weekend, it grossed just shy of $4.5 million, ranking second behind Break It. It was a modest hit during its theatrical run, but blew up when it was released on VHS. Ringwald and Hall were both only 16 years old when the movie was released. The original soundtrack was released as a specially priced mini album containing only five songs which is a bit of a bummer considering that the movie itself features an extensive selection of over 30 tracks. Hughes loves to include the Beatles as Ted Farmer sings Birthday to Sam in the auto shop. Do 
Jimmy Iovine, the future co-founder and head of Interscope Records, was the film's music supervisor. Like other films around this time, the VHS releases, TV broadcasts, and the initial DVD release changed the majority of the soundtrack. Hate that rock and roll rubbish. Thankfully, the 2003 DVD and Blu-ray release restored the original theatrical soundtrack as intended by Hughes. Well, I'm afraid it's here to stay, Howie. That same year, USA Network announced a made-for-TV sequel called 32 Candles, showcasing the characters 16 years after the original film. At the time, it was unknown if any of the original cast would be involved, but that was unimportant as the film never came to fruition. And over the years, Molly Ringwald had expressed interest in a sequel, but after rejecting various pitches, Ringwald said in 2005 that she read a 32 Candles script that resonated with her, likely the USA Network's version. By 2008, Ringwald was campaigning for a sequel to be produced, but she was uncomfortable doing the film without Hughes' involvement, who at that point was uninterested in the idea. Sadly, Hughes' death in 2009 has surely put talks of a sequel to bed. Based on the amount of criticism this film has received both when it was originally released and retrospectively, it's fair to consider this as Hugh's most controversial film. Shit, I got Carol in the bedroom right now, passed out cold. I could violate her ten different ways if I wanted to. A lot of the criticism has been focused on the character of, you guessed it, Long Duck Dong for being an offensive stereotype of Asian people, up there with Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's. At the time of its release, Roger Ebert defended Watanabe's performance, writing that the actor elevates his role from a potentially offensive stereotype to high comedy. Watanabe also claims the gong sound effect wasn't included in the script, saying he thinks the gong was something they added. Somebody must have had a few beers. When Ringwald was asked about the character during a 2010 interview, she defended Hughes by saying that comedy can be cruel and why political correctness is important in many instances, it would be pretty much the death of comedy if it were taken to the extreme. However, by 2018, she had changed her mind on this as she became more aware of the negative effect of the character and how it impacted Asian Americans. She now perceives the character as insensitive, saying that the character is a grotesque stereotype, as other writers have detailed far more eloquently than I could. <laughs> Why, you little scuzzbag! Wow! In addition, Ringwald was extremely uncomfortable with some sexually charged scenes, especially the sequence where Ted takes photos of an unconscious drunk girl when he takes her home after a party. But she also noted that Morris, who played the role, told her that she wasn't bothered by the scene. And while I don't disagree with those points, I think it's unfair to judge this film by contemporary standards since it was clearly a product of its time. Controversy aside, of all the films Molly Ringwald made with John Hughes, she said she had the most fun on 16 Candles. In the end, I award 16 Candles, 3.5 Molly Ringwalds out of 5. So what do we learn from this beloved comedy classic? Just be your best self. If it's meant to be, circumstances will work out and everything will just fall into place. Hello, and welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're heading to school on a Saturday as we kick it with The Breakfast Club. Written, produced, and directed by Hughes, the film explores teenagers from different high school cliques who were forced together in Saturday detention. Around the summer of 1983, as filming came to an end on Hughes' directorial debut, Sixteen Candles, Hughes asked his two stars, Molly Ringwald and Anthony Michael Hall, to be in his next project, a little film called The Breakfast Club. Hughes recounted that he intended The Breakfast Club to be his first feature film in the director's chair. However, his request to direct the project was met with resistance and skepticism because he lacked filmmaking experience. On another note, Universal execs complained that there were no bare breasts, no party scenes, no guys drinking beer, you know, things that they thought a teen flick needed at the time. Ultimately, Hughes convinced the investors that the modest $1 million budget and its single location shoot would minimize their risk. The screenplay by Hughes was written in just two days, very similar to how quickly 16 Candles was penned too. The film's title comes from the nickname invented by students and staff for detention at New Trier High School, which was attended by the son of one of Hughes' friends. Those who were sent to detention were designated involuntary members of The Breakfast Club. 
The term could have also originated from a defunct but long-running radio program based in Chicago called Don McNeil's Breakfast Club. Now, before we continue further, we'd like to thank you for watching John Hughes Revisited. If you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes live. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. The film assembled a small, intimate young group of actors known affectionately as the Brat Pack. Hall was the first actor to sign up for the film, playing Brian, or The Brain. Molly Ringwald stars as Claire, the princess. Originally, she was approached to play the basket case, but she was really upset because she wanted to play the princess. Other actors considered for the role were Robin Wright, Jodie Foster, and Laura Dern. Eventually, Ringwald convinced Hughes and the studio to give her the part. Her entire outfit was purchased specifically for the character from a Ralph Lauren store, the only one in Chicago at the time. As for where Paul Gleason got his outfit from? Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? The role of Allison, the basket case, went to Ali Sheedy. Fun fact, she was almost cast in the lead role of Sam Baker in 16 Candles instead of Ringwald. When Sheedy auditioned for that film, she had two black eyes from a set building accident. A, what the fuck was happening on that set? And B, the black eyes gave her a dark gothic image, which stayed with Hughes. So when it came time to cast the part of Allison, he remembered and called up Sheedy. Emilio Estevez initially auditioned for the role of John Bender, the criminal, since it was more in line with the type of roles that Estevez had previously played. However, when Hughes was unable to find someone for the role of the athlete, Estevez was recast. Hughes had also considered Michael J. Fox, Jim Carrey, Rob Lowe, Tom Cruise, and future Ferris Bueller, Matthew Broderick. Judd Nelson nabbed the standout role of Bender, with other actors considered for the part being Jim Carrey, again, John Cusack, and Nicolas Cage himself. The production could not afford to pay Cage's salary at the time, so Hughes cast Cusack as John Bender, which had the actor traveling between Chicago and Los Angeles for rehearsals. In the end, Hughes went in a different direction and replaced him with Nelson right before shooting started because Cusack did not look threatening enough for the role. Before Universal chose 16 Candles as the more commercially viable film, John's sister, Joan Cusack, was set to play Allison. Hughes gave them both consolation roles on 16 Candles to make up for this. To prepare for his role, Nelson went undercover at a local high school outside Chicago near where the crew was shooting. He was able to convince the teenagers that he was a legitimate student by buying beer for them with his fake ID. He was 24 at the time. He also went to a laundromat in character, but the looks he was giving to a woman there caused a paranoid bystander to dial 911 on him. Bender's clothes seen in the film are the same ones Nelson auditioned in for the role. Even the switchblade he used in the film actually belonged to Nelson, and he explained that he had it for protection. Paul Gleason plays authoritarian vice principal Richard Vernon. The character is based on a wrestling coach from Hughes High School who flunked him in gym. Years later, Hughes ran into him and the coach said the movie was good, but the teacher was a real jerk. The next time I have to come in here, I'm cracking skulls. Rick Moranis was cast as Carl the Janitor first. He grew a thick beard and decided to play the character with a Russian accent. Hughes was on board to let Moranis reinterpret the character, but producer Ned Tannen was so opposed to Moranis' comical creative liberties that he replaced him with John Capellos, who Hughes had worked with on 16 Candles. During filming, Capellos rarely associated with the other cast members to maintain a feeling of isolation. Hughes had also cast Karen Lee Hopkins as Robin, a gym teacher who gives the teens advice. However, Ringwald, Sheedy, and producer Michelle Manning objected to a scene in which Robin was seen nude in the locker room, likely created to appease execs, so Hughes removed her character and gave her scenes to Carl. Once again, like in 16 Candles, the only two actors of the main cast that were actually teens were Ringwald and Hall. Everyone else was well into their 20s. Hughes even pulls a Hitchcock and gives himself a cameo in this film, playing the brief role of Brian's dad. Mom, we're not supposed to study, we just have to sit there and do nothing. Well, mister, you figure out a way to study. Yeah. Principal photography kicked off on March 28, 1984, and wrapped of May of that year. Filming took place at Maine North High School in Illinois, which had been closed since May 1981. The same setting was used for interior scenes of another Hughes film, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. There's actually a fun theory that this film takes place in the same universe as Ferris Bueller, with Vice Principal Vernon working under Principal Ed Rooney. The library at the high school was deemed too small for the film, 
which prompted the crew to build a virtually identical but larger set in the school's gymnasium. Which was a common tactic on Hughes projects, the actors all rehearsed for three weeks and then shot the film in sequence. On the Ferris Bueller's Day Off commentary, Hughes admitted that he shot both films concurrently to save time and money. Contrary to reports that Ali Sheedy shook her real dandruff onto her pencil drawing, that effect was achieved by sprinkling Parmesan cheese. She did, however, really eat the sandwich filled with pixie sticks and Captain Crunch cereal, just as it appears in the final film. In reality, Molly Ringwald could not do that cool lipstick trick. They had to use different camera angles to make it appear that she could, courtesy of cinematographer Thomas Del Ruth. Judd Nelson continued to stay in character off camera, and at one point during shooting, Hughes was disappointed with Nelson because he harassed Ringwald off camera as part of his process. You are a bitch! Apparently, he would make fun of her blind musician father, touch on other hot button issues, and bully her. And the Susanna Gora's book, You Couldn't Ignore Me If You Tried, which is taken from a line from this film. You couldn't ignore me if you tried. Ringwald said she so knew what Nelson was doing and was not phased by his method actor attacks. However, Hughes was not so tolerant and understanding. He almost fired Nelson because of his antics. The other actors, including Paul Gleason, defended Nelson and convinced Hughes not to fire him, saying that Nelson was a good actor and trying to get into character. After the film wrapped, Hughes said he would never work with Nelson again because he was basically acting like his psychopath punk character on the set the whole time. During the scene where all the main characters sit in a circle on the library floor and tell each other about why they were in detention was not scripted. So that's how Hughes is able to write these scripts in two days. Hughes was really receptive to the actors' improvisations and told them all to ad-lib their stories. Some on the spot lines, including Brian's reason for having a fake ID, so I can vote, made into the film. Judd Nelson even made up many of the terms used in the film. You're a neo maxi zoom dweeby. And the joke that Bender tells while crashing through the ceiling but never finishes actually has no punchline. It was just another line that Nelson ad libbed. Originally, he was supposed to tell a joke that would end when he came back into the library and said, Forgot my pencil. But no one could come up with a punchline. He even improvised this. <laughs> Gross. During the dance sequence, only Claire was scripted to dance, but Ringwald felt uncomfortable dancing by herself, so Hughes had the entire cast dance along with her, with them voting that Chidi was the best dancer. Surprisingly, Ringwald has expressed regret over this decision, because not only did she think her dancing was bad, her inability to do the dance solo led to the cheesy choreographed dance routine, which she feels hurt the movie. I have to disagree with her. That sequence wouldn't be the same without all the characters getting in on the fun. It also provided some much needed catharsis for everyone involved. However, Ringwald wasn't the only one with regrets, as Hughes had his own about this same sequence. But this time, it was the use of the breaking glass effect that he wished he could remove. Once again, I respectfully disagree. That effect really punctuates the entire montage. Also, my dude got so high that he really busted out cartwheels and screamed so loud that the glass broke. Damn, we all could use some of that. According to Judd Nelson, Anthony Michael Hall went through a growth spurt during production. At the start, Hall was shorter than him, but by the end, he was taller than Nelson. This isn't Hall's first rodeo, as he also went through a growth spurt on the set of National Lampoon's Vacation, with him becoming taller than his sister Audrey by the end. For the final shot, Judd Nelson improvised the action where Bender raises his fist in defiance. In the script, the character was supposed to just walk into the sunset, but Hughes asked him to play around. When he was done and they were finishing up, Nelson threw up his fist without running it by anyone. Naturally, everyone loved it, and since then, the shot has become an iconic symbol of the 80s, as well as cemented forever in cinema history. As production wrapped, Hughes gifted each actor a piece of the library's banister to commemorate the shoot. That's what I thought. The Breakfast Club was released nationwide on February 15, 1985. For the time, the budget was very low, equating to about $2.5 million today. It received an A from both critics and the box office, raking in a total of $51.5 million worldwide, equivalent to over $130 million in today's money. Not bad. Roger Ebert awarded the film three stars, and it marked the start of Hollywood's heightened interest in producing teen movies, leading to a sort of renaissance for the genre. The first cut of the film was two and a half hours in length, with the final film being cut down to just 97 minutes. 
In 2018, the Criterion Collection released a special edition containing new features such as 50 minutes of deleted and extended scenes, previously unavailable on a home format. One scene in particular has Carl predicting where the five kids will be in 30 years. Six facelifts and two boob jobs by the time you're 40, and a husband with more girlfriends than anniversaries. Similar to Home Alone, there was originally supposed to be a dream sequence. Allison imagines Andrew as a gluttonous Viking, Bender as a prisoner, Claire as a bride, Brian as an astronaut, and herself as a vampire. Naturally. And if you'd like to spend more time with these characters, I highly recommend checking out the rest of the footage left on the cutting room floor. Of course, we'd be remiss not to discuss the indelible soundtrack, specifically the song that bookends the film. The soundtrack features evocative music of the 80s and was produced by British pop musician Keith Forsey, who also wrote the theme song. Don't you forget about me. Forsey was also the composer of the film, and he was chosen because he was a drummer, and Hughes was keen on having the score be heavy on drums and bass to mirror the emotions of the characters. The iconic song reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The David Bowie quote that opens the film is pulled from his song Changes. Ali Sheedy suggested this quote to Hughes, who liked it and included it in the opening. The movie was initially conceived as the start of a franchise with subsequent sequels checking in on the characters every 10 years or so. Obviously, this did not come to pass due to the volatile relationship between John Hughes and Judd Nelson. I'm hurt. Also, at the time, it was unclear whether or not Hughes still held ill will against his off-cast starlet, Molly Ringwald. The same applied to Anthony Michael Hall, as they both had a falling out with Hughes in the late 80s after the two young stars decided to move on from the teen film genre to pursue more adult roles, effectively severing their relationships with Hughes. In the 2001 parody film, Not Another Teen Movie, Gleason reprised his role as Vice Principal Vernon in a short scene that spoofs The Breakfast Club. Cry me a river, dickface. You just bought yourself another one. And Ringwald had a small cameo, too. I love you, too. We all know where this is going. Fucking teenagers. In 2012, the TV show Victorious aired their own version of the film titled The Breakfast Bunch. Very clever. Even the Autobots are a fan of the film, as it was honored in 2018's Bumblebee. Dozens and dozens of films have cited The Breakfast Club as an influence, ranging from Spider-Man Homecoming to Paranorman. After the film became a huge hit, Hughes was asked to write the script as a play so that high schoolers could perform it. A few schools actually tried it out, with one shutting down production 10 minutes into its second act, due to, what else, overbearing parents. The Breakfast Club has been called the quintessential 1980s film and considered to be John Hughes' magnum opus. It was the rebel without a cause of its generation and gave a voice to the contemporary American teenager and offered both a humorous and sobering exploration of angst, trauma, and social classes. The film's iconic poster, featuring the five characters huddled together as a family, influenced the way that teen films were marketed from that point on. Even other genre films got in on the fun, with the horror comedy Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 lampooning The Breakfast Club's poster. Even Bender uses the phrase, eat my shorts, years before a Mr. Bart Simpson ever utters those three words. Eat. My. Shorts. In a meta full circle moment, when on Futurama, Bender the Robot, who by the way was named by the show creator Matt Groening for The Breakfast Club's Bender, finds a Bart Simpson doll that says, my shorts. Okay. Mmm, shorts. In 2016, the film was inducted into the U.S. National Film Registry to be preserved due to its cultural significance. The main theme of the film is the constant struggle of the American teenager to be understood by adults and by themselves. It explores the pressures put on teenagers to fit into their own realms of high school social constructs, as well as the lofty expectations of their parents, teachers, and other authority figures. On the surface, the students have little in common with each other, but as the day goes on, they eventually bond over a common disdain of peer pressure and societal expectations. Another major theme is stereotyping. At the start, the characters put each other into a box and label them. Well, I'll just run right out and join the wrestling team. <laughs> Maybe the prep club too. Student council. No, they wouldn't take you. 
Once the obvious stereotypes are broken down, the characters learn to empathize with each other's struggle, dismiss some of the inaccuracies of their first impressions, and discover that they are more similar than different. Even Brian's choice of shop class plays into this theme. I thought I was playing it real smart, you know, because I thought, you know, I'll take shop. Maybe it's such an easy way to maintain my grade point average. Why'd you think it'd be easy? While Moranis would have been funny in the role of Carl, I'm grateful we didn't get his over-the-top Russian stereotype. That probably would have undercut the film's message. I really do love the scene between Vernon and Carl the janitor. It hints that Vernon has likely experienced burnout in terms of his job. Having student after student sent to his office for discipline over the years seems to have taken a toll on him. <sighs> Vernon doesn't like his job much anymore and is actually serving his own form of detention, forced to spend his whole Saturday at school too. Vernon says to Carl that he thinks the student attitudes have changed over the years and he's scared that the kids he deals with will one day be running the country. Carl counters by saying it's actually Vernon's attitude that's changed, and the kids are pretty much still the same. Come on, Vern, the kids haven't changed, you have. And Carl's right. There will always be kids getting in trouble like Bender. Just as I'm sure Vernon got into his fair share of trouble back in the day. I also love the blink and miss it moment in the opening sequence, displaying a plaque with Carl the janitor as Shermer High's Man of the Year. It's such a great minor detail that really adds a lot of depth to the character and plays into the film's themes of not judging a book by its cover. Recently, in light of the Me Too movement, Molly Ringwald described watching the film with her 10-year-old daughter. Ringwald recalls the time where she and her mother tried to persuade Hughes to scrap the scene where Bender peeks at Claire's panties as she's sitting at her desk in a short skirt, but Hughes refused. <sighs> Ringwald said he hired an adult woman as a stand-in for the shot because Ringwald was a minor at that point and didn't think it was legal to film a minor's panty-covered crotch. You know, she's probably right. But she said that even having another person pretend to be her was embarrassing and upsetting to her mother, even though they both knew about the scene when Ringwald accepted the role. Today, she finds the crowd-pleasing romance between her character and Bender difficult to root for now. I hate you. Yeah? Good. Bender spends most of the movie harassing Claire just leave me alone. And how is Bender rewarded for all this bullying? By having Claire kiss him, give him her earring, and essentially start a relationship with him. Ringwald herself has discussed how disturbed she is by all this. Why don't you go close that door? We'll get the prom queen impregnated. Particularly about the mixed messages this sends to her daughter in the next generation. Additionally, Ali Sheedy said in 2020 that she disliked her character's end of the film makeover, where Allison's appearance is transformed covering her in blush and eyeshadow, and giving her a pink dress and headband to wear. Sheedy didn't like the message it relayed, that she had to change herself to get a boy to notice her. Sheedy and Ringwall tried to petition Hughes to change it to promote a less negative message. She didn't want Claire to put makeup on Allison's face, and had hoped that her physical transformation would involve merely slipping off her enormous black sweater and wearing with pride the plain white shirt she had on underneath. But Hughes didn't go for that. It was the 80s, and they wanted their ugly duckling becomes a swan transition. And although she was bothered by scenes of sexual harassment in this film, Ringwald stood by the work, recognizing that these issues were a product of the times, and that Hughes' films were still beneficial in helping teens assert their independence and identity. In interviews, Ringwald has said that this movie is about the universal feeling we all have, especially in high school, that we are all outsiders, we all feel alone, and yet we all want to be accepted. If there's something we could all take away from the film, it's the notion that even though, despite our labels, we can come together and realize that we're not so different from one another. Hello there, and welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're firing up the old computer and strapping bras to our heads as we take a look back at Weird Science. Weird Science! Released in 1985, the same year as our lord and savior Marty McFly, Weird Science is a genre-bending sci-fi teen comedy about two high school nerds who use a computer program to literally create their dream woman. Remember how I said Pretty in Pink was an outlier in Hughes' teen flick series? Well, Weird Science is a straight-up anomaly. It's the antithesis of the more grounded, emotionally raw teen movies he made. Written and directed by Hughes, naturally, it was the first time that the filmmaker really blends genres and goes for some major swings. The film is loosely based on the story, Made of the Future, by Al Feldstein, in which a man builds a wife from a kit he got on a trip to the year 2150. That story was printed in a 50s anthology comic book series called, you guessed it, Weird Science. Published by the company EC Comics, 
the same publisher as the more popular series Tales from the Crypt and Mad Magazine. The rights of the magazine were acquired by the film's producer, Joel Silver. According to Silver, Hughes was in his office one day when boxes of the comics were being delivered and unpacked. Upon seeing the title Weird Science and thinking of a beautiful woman he and Silver had seen earlier that day, Hughes wondered, what if two kids figured out a way to make that girl? And the rest is 80s history. As usual, Hughes quickly whipped up the script in only two days, the same amount of time it takes Amazon to ship out the Blu-ray for this film. Now, before we continue further, we'd like to thank you for watching John Hughes Revisited. If you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes live. Now back to the show. The film stars Hughes regular Anthony Michael Hall as awkward teen Gary Wallace. Hall had actually passed on National Lampoon's European vacation to be in this film, probably due to the fact that Hughes would actually be involved with this production. Elan Mitchell Smith co-stars as Wyatt Donnelly, Gary's nerdy best friend. Before Elan started acting, he attended a ballet school on scholarship. Today, he very seldom acts, only recently appearing in the Goldbergs' version of Weird Science as Mr. Connolly, and instead became a professor of medieval English literature at Cal State Long Beach. Once a nerd, always a nerd, I suppose. Nerd! Kelly LeBrock plays Lisa, the perfect dream woman who was created from Wyatt's computer. Demi Moore and Robin Wright also auditioned for the part, and another Kelly was originally cast as Lisa, Kelly Emberg, but she was replaced shortly after filming commenced. LeBrock initially turned down the role as she was enjoying her own European vacation in France at the time and was having too much fun riding horses on the beach. Her character's name was inspired by Apple's first GUI computer, the Apple Lisa. It was the first personal computer to have a graphical user interface. Basically, you can play and click on icons instead of typing line commands. Released in 1983, it sold very poorly due to its massive cost of about $10,000, not adjusted for inflation, but it had a lasting influence on computers and on John Hughes' imagination. Credit where credit's due, LeBrock really holds her own opposite these two hormone-crazed teenagers. We also have the late and great Bill Paxton playing Wyatt's older brother Chet, who loves to torture the little guy until LeBrock's Lisa turns him into the turd monster. Hi dudes! Paxton got his character's distinctive military style haircut without Hugh's permission. On Paxton's very first day on set, he told the makeup artist that he wanted a haircut that was really intense. Fortunately, Hughes loved it, along with everything else the actor brought to the character. You're stewed, buttwad! Megastar Robert Downey Jr. plays Ian, one of the bullies. Hughes had almost worked with Downey before on Pretty in Pink, when Ringwald lobbied for him to get the part of Ducky, but the filmmakers went with John Cryer instead. RDJ and AMH would later work together on the 1985-86 to 86 season of Saturday Night Live, also known as one of SNL's worst seasons ever. Yeah, yeah and I, I think we proved our point, Mr. Political Analyst. They've remained good friends as Hall is the godfather of RDJ's son. Robert Russler plays Max, the other bully, in his film debut. Suzanne Snyder and Judy Aronson play Deb and Hilly respectively, the love interests for the bullies as well as the leading nerds. Vernon Wells has a part in the third act as Lord General, the leader of the mutant biker gang, essentially reprising his role for Mad Max, the Road Warrior. I guess Joel Silver must have liked working with Wells and Paxton, as they would both go on to star in Commando, another film he produced that released later that same year. John Capellos was also another character actor that Hughes loved collaborating with. He plays the candy bar club owner, Dino. The cuss word, Malaka, that Capellos used was actually a Greek swear, and it angered his mother when she saw the film. Also, something to note, other than Anthony Michael Hall, John Capellos was the only actor to appear in all three of John Hughes' teen films made under contract with Universal. How about a nice, greasy pork sandwich served in a dirty ashtray? 
Robert Ressler, who plays Max the bully, said the first scene he ever filmed as a professional actor was when his character dumps the slushy on Garrett and Wyatt at the mall. The celebratory handshake that he does with Robert Downey Jr. right before pouring it on them was improvised. There's also a very odd story involving RDJ clearing up the rumor that he, uh, defecated in Kelly LeBrock's trailer. I'm getting in my pants! He stated that he and his co-star Robert Rustler joked about defecating in people's trailers throughout the shoot. Do you think he'll embarrass us tonight? Eventually, he did the dirty deed in one female cast member's trailer, right on her chair. But it was not LeBrock's. The stunt almost got him fired, as Joel Silver questioned everyone in the cast as to who did it. And when he asked Downey, his response was, no, but I sure wish it was me who did it. Cool. Downey went on to state that there was never any tension between him and Hughes, and he highly respected their friendship. Rustler also noted that the scene when the rocket comes up through the floor was a complicated shot to execute. Right before cameras rolled, Hall farted loudly, breaking the cast member's concentration and ruining the take. Rustler estimated that the scene cost $100,000 to shoot. Since the take was blown, it had to be filmed in reverse, with additional tweaks in post-production. Of course, not everything made it into the final cut of the film. Some material left on the cutting room floor was a scene of Gary and Wyatt cooking in the kitchen at the very beginning, and a bunch of weenies wearing Devo helmets trying to get into Gary and Wyatt's party. Another sequence showed Max and Ian, after they fled the party once the bikers invade, being engulfed in multicolored clouds before transforming into a pig and donkey. They then bend over to see the reflections and hubcaps of a car, and tails rip through the seats of their pants. Producer Joel Silver insisted on cutting the scene, rationalizing that it detracted from a later transformation in the film. Obviously, he's referring to the large Chet monster puppet, which was designed to be solely operated by Paxton himself, but he became too claustrophobic in the suit to perform. So two little people were crammed inside and operated the creature in unison. Hey, Chet happens. During the house party sequence, even though Chet is away, Bill Paxton showed up in disguise to get in on the fun feeling of chaos on set while the party scenes were shot. I looked over the shots and couldn't find him. So if you spot him, please share with the rest of the class. The piano player, Kim Malin, who was also a Playboy model, performed her own stunts during the party scenes. This includes having her clothes ripped off like she was sitting behind a jet turbine, and a crane when thrust into the air before landing in the swimming pool half naked. And the final goodbye scene between Anthony Michael Hall, Elon Mitchell Smith, and Kelly LeBrock moved John Hughes to tears. Well, what about your girl in, um, Canada? She was in Canada. This girl's no morals. You know, I don't, I don't like that on a girl. I, it's rough having those kind of relationships, you'll see. <clears throat> anyway, get to work. The film was released in the U.S. on August 2nd, 1985, and placed number four at the box office in its opening weekend, behind Back to the Future, National Lampoon's European Vacation, the sequel to the original written by Hughes, and Fright Night. By the end of its theatrical run, the movie grossed just shy of $39 million worldwide against a budget of $7.5 million. The title song was written and performed by American New Wave band Oingo Boingo, whose frontman was none other than Danny Elfman. According to Elfman, the song was written spontaneously while he was in the car driving home to LA after a phone call from director John Hughes asking him to write the song for his latest movie. Elfman claimed to have heard the whole thing in his head by the time he made it home to his studio to record the demo. The song itself reached number 45 on the US Billboard Hot 100 and had its own music video featuring the band performing in an abstract laboratory. Later, Elfman expressed embarrassment at the video, stating that he was horrified by the outcome and that it was the only Oingo Boingo music video in which he had not been involved with production. But we'll have to save that story for Danny Elfman Revisited. Now, because this film is so bizarre, I'd like to take a moment to show how it was marketed for international audiences. In Japan, the film was called Electric Venus, which a reporter once misheard as Electric Penis during an interview with star Elon Mitchell Smith. Eh, close enough. Other foreign titles include Dream Woman for Finland and Sweden, Oh This Science for Russia, and Touch Me I'm Yours for Denmark. In his review, Roger Ebert noted LeBrock as wonderful in her role and thought the film was funnier and a little deeper than the predictable story it might have been. 
His counterpart, Gene Siskel, wasn't as kind to the film, giving it one and a half stars out of four and referred to it as a disappointment. Ebert slammed Siskel for being too uptight and said to him, They sounded like the parents committed. No, I'm not like the yes, parents committed. In the time since its release, the film has become a cult classic. However, while the film was a hit when it came out, most critics seem to agree with Siskel, and it is now thought as one of John Hughes' lesser movies, not rising to the level of other classics like Sixteen Candles and The Breakfast Club. I mean, the next thing you know, you'll be wearing a bra on your head. Oh, the old man's gonna have a stroke on this one for sure. Similar to Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the film received its own television spin-off, in 1994, a year before the film's 10th anniversary, it was made into a television series which also used the film's theme song as its own. It received not one, not two, five seasons consisting of 88 episodes running from 1994 to 98 on the USA Network. The series starred Vanessa Angel as Lisa, Michael Manasseri as Wyatt, John Mallory Asher as Gary, and Lee Turgeson as Chet. Here's where it gets really weird though, as instead of following the same basic plot of creating this woman in a computer, the series establishes that genies and other magical beings exist. In the show, Lisa is a genie master and implies that she's there to help the boys rather than having been created by them. I guess to be fair, the movie's version of Lisa acted more like a living god than a living doll. She can manipulate memories, molecules, and reality. She's like Scarlet Witch. I could only find a handful of episodes on YouTube, one of which has Bruce fucking Campbell guest starring as, what else, a magical genie. Fittingly, one of the series creators would go on to create the Evil Dead TV show, Ash vs. Evil Dead. Other guest stars on the show over the years were Denise Richards, Michael Clark Duncan, Larry Hankin of Breaking Bad fame, Adam West as himself, and Seth Green, who was actually one of the finalists for the part of Gary. Reportedly, John Hughes didn't even know that the TV series existed until he saw a commercial for it. Famously, Hughes refused to help on any television adaptation of his work, so the studio didn't even bother asking. Hughes told an interviewer that he was sitting at home watching TV, and this commercial comes on for this new show. He's watching it thinking, Jesus, they ripped me off. This looks just like weird science. Imagine his surprise. In 2013, news broke that Universal was planning a Weird Science remake with original producer Joel Silver returning and screenwriter Michael Bacall, who wrote Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and the 21 Jump Street movies, penning the script to involve a 3D printer this time around. The film was set to distinguish itself from the original by being an edgier comedy, more in line with 21 Jump Street and The Hangover. In 2017, Elon Mitchell Smith talked about a sequel to the original starring Channing Tatum. However, as of 2022, nothing more of the remake had materialized. Honestly though, this is truly a movie that could have only been made in the 80s. Could you even imagine this film getting a reboot with Channing Tatum today? Two nerdy 15-year-old teenage girls creating a hunky guy in their bedroom and then having him take them around town telling people their relationship is purely sexual? Yikes. Like Molly Ringwald in Pretty in Pink, this would be Anthony Michael Hall's final collaboration with John Hughes. People always say Ringwald was John Hughes' muse, but I think they overlook Hall. He starred in three films directed by Hughes himself, as opposed to Ringwald's two. And Hughes had also worked with him earlier for National Lampoon's Vacation when he gave the young actors big break as Rusty Griswold. In the time since splitting with Hughes, Hall had a similar career trajectory to Ringwald, starring in some lesser known films and venturing more into TV, landing the lead role in The Dead Zone. He's popped up over the years with a cameo in The Dark Knight and even a substantial role as Tommy Doyle in Halloween Kills, which, in my opinion, I thought he crushed that part. As far as weird science goes, this is definitely John Hughes' most out there and dated teen angst film. Scenes such as the computer sequence, which after watching this in Pretty in Pink back to back, I'm not sure John Hughes knew how computers worked, but I guess in the 80s, computers were basically magic to everyone. Also, the scene with Hall talking jive at the bar hasn't aged well. Hall said he and Hughes were inspired by Richard Pryor movies that they watched on the weekend, so I guess it was a product of its time. Even so, there's no denying that it's also a relic of the 80s, a film set in a bygone era with a questionable nature that more than earns the weird part of its title. It's hardly as refined as Hugh's other efforts, even if it contains similar themes from his previous outings. 
the film operates as pure teenage boy wish fulfillment, as if someone plugged this movie directly into the brain of a horny teenage boy. Hughes was not so much concerned with digging deep into these characters' psyches as he was with just letting everyone and everything run wild. That being said, it still has enjoyable performances and that Hughes charm as it really gave him a chance to blow up some steam and go balls to the wall with the story. So for those reasons, I award Weird Science 2.5 out of 5 turd monsters. Also, can anyone tell me what happened to Wyatt's catatonic grandparents stuffed in the kitchen pantry? Are they still in there? Did they wake up and just leave the house? Were they magically transported out of the house? Were their memories wiped like Gary's parents? I don't know what the hell you're talking about, Lucy, and I want you to shut up. Someone needs to check on those old folks. <clears throat> Anyways, until next time, thanks for watching. Yeah.